Thank you, Michael. It's certainly a, uh, a pleasure to be here, joining you all this evening, and thank you for the invitation. I want to share uh, uh, a few stories with you tonight and uh, talk to you about uh, Hands Across the Water, and I thank you for considering or for taking uh, our charity on. I hope it's a rewarding experience, and I hope by the end of the evening you understand a bit more about what we do. What I did want to do, though, is start with uh, how Hands came about. Uh, then it'll make sense as to how a forensic policeman from New South Wales ends up uh, building homes for children in Thailand. It started here, and this is... Um, anyone recognise this place? Where is it? Well, Thailand's a pretty obvious guess. Can we... Uh, anyone more specific? Is it Koh Phi It is, indeed. No wonder you're the president. <laughs> You told me. <laughs> I did. I landed on this beach in a helicopter and uh, I looked at this and thought, this is quite stunning, this is where I've been sent to work. And I thought I should take some photos because when I return home, people aren't going to believe how beautiful this is. But I walked 180 degrees around the other side of the helicopter that had dropped me onto the island and this was the destruction that was on PP Island. And this is so typical of where I've been to do the type of crisis work that I have. I could replace this with photos from Paddy's Bar or the Sari Club after the bombings in Bali because the level of destruction that we saw there was just the same. And working in these areas, we're certainly presented with unique challenges. And to meet those unique challenges, you have to have unique solutions. So what were some of the challenges that we faced? Well, what we know as a result of the Boxing Day tsunamis, there were somewhere between 250 and 300,000 people who would lose their lives. And we headed across to Thailand to do what's called disaster victim identification. We're there to identify those who have died and send them home. And in Thailand, we recovered 5,395 bodies, which was and remains the world's largest disaster victim identification attempt. Thousands bigger than 9-11, therefore thousands bigger than anything that had been seen in this space before. And the very scale of it presented a lot of unique challenges. Because when they found the bodies floating in the water or washed up on the beach, they took them to a local temple. And if you've been to a Buddhist temple, you understand when I say they have a very serene feel about them, a very sacred feel, regardless of whatever your faith is. And I arrived at this beautiful Buddhist temple called Wat Yan Yao, and I walked in through the gates, and all I could see in an area maybe, maybe 10, 15 times the size of the room we're in tonight, was the decomposing bodies of three and a half thousand people that laid on the ground. Now as a forensic practitioner, we have to do a post-mortem on each of these people. But where do you store the bodies of three and a half thousand people while you undertake this job? Because it's something that's going to take us well over 12 months to achieve. And how do, you, how do you go about identifying that many bodies? And we had, there was 450 staff, forensic staff from around the world who arrived to assist, and they came from 36 different countries. But when something like this happens, there's no international org chart in place that says that if something happens, this is a country that will take the lead. There's nothing like that in place. It all just has to be sorted out once we arrive. And, how do we meet these challenges? Well, it's about building teams and it's about leadership. And as, as Michael said, I spent the last two years that I was with New South Wales Police working on a counter-terrorism project. And in particular, I was focusing on what we call CBRN, which is Chemical, Biological, Radiological and Nuclear Threats. So I spent 12 months working with Interpol in Lyon in France, sharing my thoughts and findings from the research I was doing. And then I was working with the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime throughout Southeast Asia. But there was a reoccurring theme in this counter-terrorism space, and that is that hope is not a plan. We just can't hope that something won't happen. But there is only so much contingency planning you can do when the challenges are so unique. So how do we meet those challenges? Well, it is about leadership, and I think there's two types of leadership that exist. There's ones around positional authority. And, and you can see, you look at any organisation, you can cascade down and see from the top to the bottom where everyone sits. But does that mean that the best people, the best decisions will only come 
from those senior positions. Because in my experience, true leaders are identified by their actions and their reactions. It's what people do, not the positions that they hold, that really makes a difference. And when the Australians turned up into Thailand, there was no conditions imposed by the Australian government upon the Thais. But once we arrived, the Australians held every key position. Every key leadership position was held by an Australian. And what was that about? What put us into those roles and why did we, why did we hold them? It had nothing to do with our experience or expertise, nothing to do with the number of bodies that we lost. As a country, we lost 25 people to the tsunami. Now the Germans lost 500, the Swedes lost 500, the Thais lost 2,500, yet the Australians were running the entire operation. There were a number of key things the Australians did. The first was, was they acted with speed. Because when there's an opportunity, the first to move so often will hold that position of leadership, and that was the Australians. The second thing they did was to deal with change and to lead with sensitivity. The third was to have a structure in place, and the fourth was to lead with simplicity. But above and beyond that, what they did was there was the importance of presence. And I think this exists in three areas. It's a leadership of the, the brand or the organisation that you lead. It's the leadership of the teams, and finally it's leadership of yourself. And after the, the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that struck the beautiful country of Japan, I was deployed over there and worked over there for, for some time, and, and I saw this presence uh, played out by a man by the name of Mr. Sato in the Awati Prefecture of Japan. But it's what the Australians did well that put us into those positions of leadership. So when I was working over there, one of the things that became clear for me is, is around leadership and what, what, what are the qualities of leaders? Well, for me, it's about having courage, and it's about facing adversity head on every day. I'm going to show you a photograph of 32 people who I'd suggest are leaders by any definition. You see, I met these children while I was working in Thailand. Each of them had lost their parents. Each of them had lost their homes, and many of them had lost their brothers and sisters. But they lived in this tent that you see in the background. It's a good-looking tent. I grant you that, but it's still just a tent. And when I met them, this was... This was in August of 2005, some seven, almost eight months on from the tsunami. It wasn't a temporary structure, this was their home. They weren't waiting for something, this was their home. I'm going to share some stories with you on this basis and this basis alone. We can't change what's happened, but we can all change what happens next. I couldn't change the fact that these kids had lost their parents but it felt within my capacity to do something around what happened next for them. So I set up this organisation called Hands Across the Water. I was still working full time in the police. I had no idea how I was going to do it, but I thought I'll give myself 12 months and see if I can raise some money to build these kids at home. I returned to Australia and, and set about giving some talks and raising some money. 12 months after making the commitment, I was able to go back over to Thailand and open this home that I built for the kids. Now, it's, it is a beautiful home. It's called Ban Tham Nam Chai. The reason I was able to raise enough money to build it was because we decided to focus on the results and not the excuses. Because when you put an idea on the table, there'll be plenty of people who will sit around and tell you why it won't work, why it's someone else's responsibility, what's wrong with it. Don't worry about them. You let them focus on the, the excuses you focus on the results. Because be sure of one thing, if we do nothing, well, nothing will change. So I built this home and all of the kids moved in. But it was 12 months later and the numbers had doubled. They'd gone from 32 to 64. We had the girls who were sleeping three to a bed. The boys were sleeping on the floor. This is 12 months on after we've opened it. So it's a couple of years now from the tsunami that the children continue to come. Why was that happening? Why was it happening? The word spread. But where were they? Well, why, where were they living before coming here? Anywhere they could lay down. See, what happens, it doesn't matter where I've worked, whether it be I worked in Saudi Arabia after the floods in Jeddah at the request of the government of, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I worked in, in Japan, 
Indonesia, Thailand, Australia, what happens after a disaster? And you would know that from the, the floods in, in Brisbane and the cyclone up north. Lots of people turn up to help, don't they? They put their flag in the ground and they say, we're here. It might be corporate, might be government, might be NGOs and charities, but six months on, too many of them pack up and leave. And what message does that send to the community when they pack up and leave? It. No. it says you're on your own. They say, we're out of here. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's six months or six years on, her parents haven't come back. And of course they never will. Just because there's another disaster, another crisis somewhere around the world, doesn't mean that these kids don't need help. And of course they always will. So I built them another home, and this one's located right next door to the first one. You can see the first one in the back right hand corner there. And I opened this one in 2000 and, um, 2011. No, 2009 I opened this one and we moved all the girls into this and, and it is a beautiful home and, and a few weeks ago I returned from opening this home which is a new one and there's that Catholic nun in the, in the foreground there that you were, you were speaking about. Where's the... <laughs> she was delivering lunch. This is a beautiful home that we've just opened at a place called Siren. And I'll share that with you a, a little bit more a bit later on about serum. But this is what they look like inside. They're full of colour and light, and thanks to the staff we have there, they're, they're, they're full of love, and just as any home should be. Now, the Chinese have a proverb, and the proverb goes like this. If you want to plan for a year, you sow rice. If you want to plan for a decade, you plant trees. If you want to plan for a lifetime, or well best educate people. So I built this centre and opened it in 2011. It cost 1.4 million Australian dollars to build, and it's in a place called uh, Ban Nam Kem, the worst affected area from the tsunami in all of Thailand. Why I built this was to provide care for those in the community. See, this community lost two and a half thousand people. The, 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 the family structure, the family network was torn apart up there. And what that did was it created all these knock-on effects because the ties rely upon extended families. And it is a beautiful thing to see. But when you take away that extended family, then you create needs for things like that we take for granted, like childcare areas. And many of you, I'm sure, provide great assistance to your your children in looking after their children. Well, when they're taken away, when the grandparents are gone, who looks after the kids? They didn't have childcare centres, so we built this, and it's a childcare centre, provides medical care, dental care, and vocational training for that community to give them another source of income. Now, it's a unique building, the, the, the uh, design of it. You see the roof at the very back there is built at a height of 17 metres above ground level. But it's been engineered to hold 1,000 people standing on the roof at any one time. What is it? A tsunami refuge area. Because it's no good saying to the members of this community what you went through was a 1 in 200 year event. Because they do worry. You can't tell them not to worry. But now this gives them a degree of peace of mind. Those of you who have little boys in your life, you'll know, and I'm assuming not many of them are your children, they might be grandchildren if they're this young, that you know that little boys love to run fast, little boys love to run real fast, and the appropriateness of the location is often lost on them. Well, this little superhero here was in the, in the race of his life. Well, we, to be more accurate, it was a race for his life. He held the hand of his grandfather, and they ran from that wall of water that was the tsunami. 50 metres in front of them was a building. If they could get to that building, that gave them the best chance of survival. Run as fast as they could though, they were never going to be able to outrun that wall of water. They got to a tree. Granddad climbed the tree and he dragged this little super superhero up to the top of the tree with him. They got to the top, they were both cut, they were bleeding, and they had abrasions all over them. But they had survived. 
But there was no wild celebrations at the top of the tree. You see, when Grandad was running, he had this little guy in his right hand, and in his left hand, he had his younger brother. And when Grandad got to the base of the tree, he knew that if he didn't survive, none of them would. He also knew he couldn't climb the tree hanging on to both of his grandchildren. He had a decision to make. Which one of his grandchildren would he take up the tree? And which one would he let go of? How do you make that decision? How do you decide who lives and who dies? He let go of this little guy's brother. He was washed away. And he did die. And every day since, Grandad asks himself the same series of three questions. I see him each time I go back to Thailand. And he's an old man now, so much older than his years would tell you. The three questions he asks himself every day is, could I have run faster? Could I have been stronger? Could I have made a different decision? The thing is, he had the courage to make a hard decision and that's what leadership's about. Every one of us in the room here tonight will at different times be faced with hard decisions. Some on a business level, some on a personal level. You lay awake for nights on end thinking, is what I'm about to do the right thing? Make that decision and spend another number of countless nights awake thinking, is what I've done the right thing? Take comfort though in the fact that you had the courage to make a hard decision that's what leadership's about. In 2009, it took some people I knew, and some I didn't. There were 17 of us, and we went on a bike ride, and we rode from Bangkok down to Kaolak, a distance of uh, 800 kilometres over eight days. Before we went away, we asked everyone who was riding with us to raise 10,000 Australian dollars and pay for their expenses on top of that. We raised over $174,000, in that first year and I thought we should do that again. So in 2010 we did it again, this time we had 34 people. In 2011 it, was, it had grown <clears throat> to the point where I did it back to back. So we rode 800 kilometres down with one group, I had two days off, flew back to Bangkok, picked up another group and rode down again. In 2012 we changed it and we started at a place called Nong Kai. We rode down the Mekong River with Laos on one side and Thailand on the other for eight days and we arrived in an orphanage. This place is called Home Hug. It's in a place called Yosaton outside of Ubon Ratchatani in the northeast of Thailand. We finished there, picked up another group and rode on and did it again uh, early this year. And you can see a pattern that we keep doing this. Well this year we, uh, we raised over 800 thousand Australian dollars before we went away and we opened the rides for registrations on the the first of March for next year and in January we'll ride again and in 90 minutes we sold out two rides and um, they are incredibly successful and what makes them successful well it's the people that we meet this beautiful lady here her name is May Phil and uh, um, she is 54 years old. 23 years ago, she set up this orphanage called Home Hug at Yossetan. And um, she set it up for children who have, who have HIV or who have lost their parents to HIV. When she heard about our ride, she said, I want to ride. I want to join you on that ride. And the reason she wanted to ride was so that she could stand in front of the children and say to them, just because you face challenges, just because the cards have been dealt against you, don't give up. Now what does she know personally about facing challenges? Well, nine years ago, she was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer and she was given six months to live. How is she still alive? It's a bit of a mystery. But three o'clock each morning before we get on the bike, she wakes up and goes through a three hour detox routine where she washes these tubes that hang from within within her body. She gets on the bike and then she rides 100 kilometres each day. 
And when we pull into the hotel, no one complains that what we've done has been too hard. No one complains we've ridden too far or it's been too hot. No one complains about much at all in her presence. She kind of takes away the excuses that we put up for things that we might not want to do. Now, I think there's, there's a number of areas in which we look after ourselves, and in the commercial world, one's around professional development. The, the second area is how you look after people and from a social and welfare perspective. But I think the third element which we, we, we miss out on because we're so busy is, is taking time to feed your soul. And my question to each of you here tonight was when was the last time you did something that really was food for your soul? For me, riding 1,600 kilometres through Thailand every January with people like this is food for my soul. But what is it for you? If you want to learn to paint, trek through Nepal or head to Paris with the person that means most to you, now's the time to do it. Don't wait until the time is right because that time might not come. If not now, then when? If not you, then who? <laughs> now the reason why the charity is so successful, the reason why hands um, and the bike rides are so successful, and they are, is because we create experiences. If you want to build the club here at Rosary, you need to create shared experiences. <laughs> When I build engagement within workplaces, it's about engineering shared experiences. And I get to do these rides every year with my, with my two uh, kids that continue to come, and um, I've got three of the two continue to ride. And this gentleman on the, on the left in the uh, blue t-shirt is my dad. Now, dad is uh, long retired. He's, uh, he'll be 75 this year, and he lives on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. His life consists of two things. One is playing bowls and one is playing golf. When he's not doing one of those, he's complaining about bowls or complaining about golf. That is the sum total of his existence. <laughs> so when I said to him, I'm going to start this ride, he said, do you think I can come over? And I said, yeah, all right. So I said to him, here's your job. I said, you can drive the support vehicle, which means you drive at the back of the pack to make sure we haven't left anyone behind. So picture this. He, his job is to drive 100 kilometres a day at an average speed of about 21 kilometres an hour. And he spends his day staring at the backside of, uh, of plenty of men who are dressed in lycra, many of whom should not be. <laughs> now, he's not a man blessed with patience, you see, to top it off. And, uh, and in those first couple of years, I was often at the back of the pack because I was riding with Jack, my, my youngest son, who was 12 years old and uh, when we first started. And we'd always be at the back and everyone else would be off, taken off the front. And, um, and Dad, in his very encouraging way, would drive closer and closer and closer <laughs> to our back wheel. Now, if you're a bike rider, you know there's nothing more intimidating. And if you're a driver who drives behind bike riders, you don't have to drive that close. We know you're there, okay? Now, I said to Dad, I thought he doesn't understand how intimidating this is. So he pulled in at the first water stop and I said, Dad, I said, here's the thing. I said, I'm really worried that you're going to run over one of us. If we fall off our bike, you'll run us over before you know what's happened. I said, can you just give us a little bit more room? He said, sure, not a problem, not a problem. We jump on the bike and not 100 metres up the road. Where is he? Right back up our backsides again. And this goes on for water stop after water stop. I ask him, I plead with him and I tell him to give us more space, but he doesn't. After two years, I'm sick of it, and I'm so worried he's gonna run us over. So at the end of the second year, I said to him, Dad, you cannot come on the rides anymore. It was a big call to make, because I loved him being there with his grandkids. So what did he do? Well, he responded as a 74-year-old man would do. He went home, and he sulked. And for weeks on end, I didn't hear from him. He just said, He's got that filthy look like you've got on your face right now. <laughs> it just sold. Then in April, we open up the bike rides for registration, and he rings me and he said, I bought myself a bike. So at the age of 74, he took up bike riding. And he started these little, little loops around Southwest Rocks. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then in 2012, he came across and he rode the whole 800 kilometres as well. 
and it was an absolutely outstanding experience to share it with you. But here's the thing. Day six on the bike ride, it's an eight day ride. Day six, it's the hardest day on tour. We've been there that long that we forgot the excitement. We're just that little bit far from the finish to be excited about finishing. Your bones are hurting, your muscles are hurting, and it's a hard day on the bike. Everyone's quiet on day six. It's after lunch on an afternoon tea at a water stop, and everyone's kind of sitting around quiet and just reflecting, and all of a sudden I hear this commotion. Bikes have been knocked over, people have been pushed out of the way, and I can hear him coming. And I look out, and I go, oh no, here he comes. He, and Dad comes over to me, he said, now you're in charge here, right? And I said, yes. He said, you're going to have to have a word to the bikes driving the car. Do you know how close they are to my dad? <laughs> Absolute <laughs> true story. Now, I'll finish up with this. So we get asked to take on lots of projects all around the world. I've been asked to go into, into Pakistan, into Sri Lanka, India, uh, Sri, um, uh, Cambodia, different areas of Thailand, and, and this year we're asked to go into the Philippines. But we can't take on every project. And you know that every year there'll be projects that are put before you and you're asked to support them, and you can't support everyone. And you have to do, you have to take it on and do the best you can. And, and when I got asked, I got a phone call four years ago from, uh, from Home Hub, from May Phil, that lady I'd never spoken, uh, never met before. And, um, and I heard enough, I thought I should travel up and see her project. So I arrived at this orphanage and what I saw were children who were sick, children who were skinny. And what I learned that the children were dying. And they died not just on a monthly basis, but on a weekly basis. And that shouldn't happen. Children with HIV shouldn't die anymore. They should live for another 50 or 60 years. Why were they dying? Well, it wasn't because Mayfield didn't care enough about them. It was because not enough people cared. See, HIV is no longer a medical problem. It's one of poverty. But we can turn that around. And when we took them on, as I said, they were dying on a weekly basis. Since we took them on four years ago, not one child has died. And that's the way it should be. Since we've taken them on, we've been able to bring about such change to their life, they don't have AIDS anymore. They still have HIV, but because of the change we've been able to bring about their, to their life, their white <coughs> blood cell counts have risen, that they don't have AIDS anymore. These are the type of changes that we've been able to bring about. We, we run seven projects across Thailand. We, we look after children through all sorts of needs and, and we've grown and we continue to grow every year. We raised almost $10 million since I set up hands back in the end of 2005. And in that time we've spent not one cent of donors' money on administration or fundraising. And that's the way it should be. We can't help everyone but we can all help some. It's been a pleasure to spend the evening with you, and I certainly, if there's, if there's time, Michael, and there's questions, I'm certainly open to those, but I, I thank you for inviting me in, and I thank you for the opportunity to, to welcome you into the hands journey uh, for next year. Thank you.